Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element cesium. Unfortunately, because of its dangerous nature, I don't have an actual sample of cesium to show you, so we'll just have to be happy with pictures in this episode. Here, we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, a visual exploration of every known atom in the universe. I encourage you to pick this one up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Cesium is the 55th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 55 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as this unique element. Cesium was discovered in 1861 by Robert Bunsen and Gustav Kirchhoff in Heidelberg, Germany, using flame spectroscopy. It's one of the four elements discovered by its spectrum. When you place a cesium salt, like cesium chloride, in a flame, the flame becomes colored indigo or violet. Potassium looks very similar and may be difficult or impossible to distinguish by eye from cesium. For that, you need a spectroscope, which is exactly what Bunsen and Kirchhoff used for their discovery. As you can see, the other alkali metals are much easier to tell apart with a flame test. Let's take a quick look at the spectrum of cesium. Because of the bright blue lines in its emission spectrum, Bunsen and Kirchhoff derive the name of the element from the Latin word cesius, meaning sky blue. From this, we get cesium, also spelled without the A. Polyxite is an important and significant ore of cesium, and sometimes rubidium. Polyxite is a zeolite mineral, meaning that it contains aluminum silicates, with calcium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium as common substituting elements. It was first described by August Breithaupt in 1846 from occurrences on the island of Elba, Italy. Polyxite is named for Pollux, the twin of Castor, on the grounds that Pollyxite is often found associated with petalite, previously known as Castorite. Tanco Mine is an underground cesium and tantalum mine owned and operated by Cabot Corporation on the northwest shore of Burnick Lake, Manitoba, Canada. The mine has the largest known deposit of polyxite, 82% of the world's reserves as a matter of fact, and was also the world's largest producer of cesium. The Tanco mine shut down and was later sold after a mine collapse in 2015. Only a few thousand kilograms of cesium chemicals are thought to be consumed in the United States every year. The United States is 100% reliant on imports for its cesium needs. The chart we've been using to talk about the origin of the elements claims that virtually all cesium, 85% of it, comes from merging neutron stars of the green area. While I have no evidence to support my opinion, this seems highly unlikely to me especially given the rarity of merging neutron star events and the availability of cesium. A new paper, recently published, proposes that neutron stars had far less influence in the evolution of the elements in the universe. Here, you see each element square with a chart of its own, showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Cesium is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at cesium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang until now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of cesium created by various processes. 
Some of the cesium present today is believed to be produced in supernovae, the yellow area. Some is produced in dying low-mass stars, the magenta region. Note the cesium produced by the dying low-mass stars doesn't get started until a bit later. This is because low-mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Supernovae are very massive stars that use their fuel up quickly and die relatively young. A small portion, the green area, is produced in merging neutron stars. Cesium is a shiny metal when it's kept away from the air. This sample is in a glass vial with inert argon gas replacing any other gas inside. If cesium is exposed to the air and its oxygen, it can spontaneously combust. It's so reactive. Note that cesium has a slightly golden hue. This is more apparent if we compare it with its neighbor above it in the periodic table, rubidium. Here, we see rubidium on the top and cesium below. Now, the golden hue is easily seen. Also note the rubidium and cesium crystals on the inside of the vial walls. How common is cesium? Not very. It's the 65th most common element in the universe, only 0.8 parts per billion. It's the 41st most abundant element in the sun, at 8 parts per billion. The 61st most abundant in meteorites, here it's at 140 parts per billion. It's oddly common in the crust of the Earth, at 1.9 parts per million, but it's only found in combination with other elements because of its high reactivity. It's the 34th most common element in the oceans, and it's even the 37th most common element in us, humans. Cesium is a member of the leftmost column of the periodic table, making up the very reactive alkali metals. Why are these elements so explosively reactive? As I just mentioned, cesium, like all its cousins in the alkali metal column, is very chemically reactive. This is because the outer electron shell contains only one out of a possible eight electrons. At the risk of anthropomorphizing a bit, cesium will do almost anything to get rid of that outer electron. If cesium could do this, it looks a lot like the previous element in this series, xenon, from the noble gas column with its complete outer shell of eight electrons. This single outer electron is what gives all the alkali metals their reactivity. Cesium, having the loosest held outer electron, is the most reactive of the group. Here, a crazy person throws about 20 grams of cesium into a tray of ice water. I hope he escapes that shower of hot cesium metal droplets headed right for him. Needless to say, don't do this at home, or anywhere else for that matter. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest cesium on the left to smallest helium on the right. Cesium is the largest of all non-radioactive elements. A gold medal for this golden metal. If we compare the size of the cesium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The cesium atom is a bit more than five and a half times the size of hydrogen. Those outer electrons are held pretty loosely. Let's compare it to the smallest atom, helium. The cesium atom is over eight and a half times the size of helium. Quite a range of sizes. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are small, even if cesium is a giant among atoms. In this graph, the vertical axis is the size of the atom, and the horizontal axis is the atomic number of the atom, the number of protons in the nucleus, starting with 1 for hydrogen and going up to 86 for radon. 
With hydrogen on the left, we see patterns. The magenta labeled noble gases found in the right column of the periodic table have very tightly held full outer electron shells. These are the smallest atoms in their respective rows. The alkali metals, the yellow labeled elements found in the leftmost column of the periodic table, all have large sized atoms because they all have only one loosely held electron in their outer shell. I've colored cesium blue. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 55 protons for cesium. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes, and they're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 40 known isotopes of cesium, making it, along with barium and mercury, one of the elements with the most isotopes. Of these 40, there is only one stable non-radioactive isotope, cesium-133, with its 55 protons and 78 neutrons. Cesium is therefore monoisotopic. There are 23 of those elements. This stable isotope, therefore, makes up 100% of the cesium in the universe. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of cesium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of cesium, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More on half-life in the next slide. The longest cesium half-life, cesium-135, has a half-life of 2.3 million years. We're going to come back to the one next down in the chart here, cesium-137, with a half-life of 30 years in a, just a bit. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide. I chose 1,024 atoms because it's a power of 2 and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, Notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Cesium is a light element at only 1.88 grams per cubic centimeter. Only slightly higher than water, which has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up a couple more densities for comparison. Even though kilogram for kilogram cesium is more expensive than gold, because of the low density of cesium, a one kilogram brick would be more than 10 times the volume of a one kilogram brick of gold. Here is a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're back face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. 
I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, cesium's density, the magenta circle, is about 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter and is the 76th densest element, just above the density of magnesium at 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Cesium is the softest of all elements, only 0.2 on Mohs scale of hardness, easily cut with a dull butter knife, but I would avoid that activity. Here's a chart of the element hardness from hardest, boron, on the left to softest, cesium, on the right. Another award for this exceptional element. Cesium has a very low melting point, a low 28.4 Celsius, or about 83.3 degrees Fahrenheit, just above room temperature. You could probably melt it in your hand if it didn't violently react with your sweat, causing serious injury. The only other metallic element with a lower melting point is mercury. All the other alkali metals also have fairly low melting points. Only lithium melts above the boiling point of water. Cesium has the 78th highest boiling point at only 671 degrees Celsius, 643 degrees Celsius above its melting point. When you do heat cesium, assuming you don't melt it, it has a fairly high rate of thermal expansion, 97 parts per million per degree centigrade, about half as much as mercury at 181 parts per million per degree centigrade, and four times aluminum's and eight times iron's expansion rate. Cesium is not a terribly good conductor of electricity, near the bottom of the chart. Of course, because of its chemical reactivity, it's rarely, if ever, used as an electrical component. Likewise, cesium is not a terribly good conductor of heat. Conductivity of heat usually follows conductivity of electricity because they both have to do with how hard it is to move around outer electrons. Okay, enough of these graphs. I like them because they let me compare elements, but I'm afraid I may be boring you. From our periodic table of the spectra, we see that cesium displays a complex variety of emission lines across the spectrum. As I mentioned earlier, the spectrum is especially bright in the blues. The current cost of cesium reflects its rarity, almost $62,000 per kilogram, higher than the current price of gold. Over the past 30 years or so, Cesium has almost doubled in value. Let's take a look at some of the major uses for cesium. The biggest use of cesium is in the form of a brine. Here I'll fill a glass jar with cesium formate brine. I'd like to thank Cinnamine Specialty Fluids for sending me a liter of this amazing liquid. It's very, very dense at about 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter. Remember, water is one gram per cubic centimeter, less than half as dense, and there are only about a dozen common liquids that are more dense. I'm going to place a solid magnesium block in the cesium formate. Magnesium, at only 1.74 grams per cubic centimeter, is less dense than the 2.2 gram per cubic centimeter of the cesium formate. The magnesium floats like a cork in water. An interesting factoid here is that cesium formate brine is actually denser than cesium metal or any of the other ingredients of cesium formate. Cesium formate brine is used in the oil drilling industry as a drill fluid. When the well is filled with cesium formate, the high density of the liquid creates a high pressure at the bottom of the well. This helps keep the drill hole from collapsing in on itself and prevents the high pressure petroleum products from rushing up the well to the surface. In spite of all those old movies you've seen of oil gushers and the delight on the faces of the well owner, it's the last thing a drill crew wants to happen. They are actually more appropriately called blowouts. Not only does this waste precious product, it's very hard to stop. Remember the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico? In addition, 
These blowouts can throw thousands of feet of drill pipe all over the place, creating a dangerous, uncontrolled, and expensive accident. Cesium formate brine prevents this from happening by filling the drill hole with a heavy, high density liquid. Cesium formate brine is very expensive. The single liter of brine Cinnamine sent me would cost over $100, so it's typically leased by oil and gas exploration clients. After they complete the well, the used cesium formate brine is returned and reprocessed by Cinnamine for future drilling operations. They can recover nearly 85% of the brine in this way. In addition, Cesium formate is more environmentally friendly than other high-density fluids. Cesium iodide is grown into crystals, which glow from green to blue when hit with a gamma ray or an X-ray. This is a scintillation counter used to detect and measure the presence and energy of X-rays and gamma rays. Under that cap at the top, is a crystal of cesium iodide. The interesting thing about this crystal is that when it's hit by a gamma ray or an x-ray, it gives off a tiny flash of light, and the brightness of that flash is proportional to the energy of the x-ray or gamma ray. The flash is exceedingly dim, so dim that you must detect it with an ultra-sensitive device like this photomultiplier tube. The cesium iodide crystal is mounted directly to the light-sensitive end of the photomultiplier. The light-sensitive substance on the inside surface of this photomultiplier tube is often cesium metal, so it's used in two different places in this instrument. The photomultiplier delivers a series of electrical pulses. These pulses are counted and have their strength measured. If you could listen to these pulses, they would sound like this. This is a visual representation, and it has time running along the horizontal axis, and the height of each pulse gives you the energy of the X-ray or gamma ray that caused it. If we measure the energy of each pulse and keep track of how many of each energy, we could build a histogram like the one you see here. The low energy on the left to the high energy ones on the right of the horizontal axis, and the count of each specific energy detection on the vertical axis. The positions of the peaks you see are unique to the radioactive substance you're measuring, allowing you to identify the specific isotope, in this case, radioactive cesium-137. Gamma ray spectroscopy is an extremely useful tool, and cesium plays a part in this. This is a gamma ray source with cesium-137 inside. Cesium-137 in the environment is substantially, if not entirely, human-made. Cesium-137 is produced from the nuclear fission of plutonium and uranium, which occurs in atomic reactors and nuclear explosions. The spread of nuclear isotopes into the atmosphere ceased with the signing of the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963. Cesium-137, with a half-life of a little over 30 years, decays into the next element of our series, barium-137. Cesium-137 had not occurred on Earth in any significant amount until the first reactor at the University of Chicago was built in late 1942. This reactor, part of the Manhattan Project to produce the atomic bomb, was located in the squash courts under the bleachers of Stagg Field, right on the university's campus. By observing the characteristic gamma rays emitted by this isotope, as we saw on the previous slide, one can determine whether the contents of a given sealed container was made before or after the first atomic bomb explosion on July 16, 1945, which spread cesium-137 into the atmosphere. Once there, it quickly distributed trace amounts around the globe. 
Checking for the presence of cesium-137 has been used by researchers to check the authenticity of certain rare wines, most notably the purported Jefferson bottles. Because they contained trace amounts of cesium-137, they were declared frauds. There was simply no cesium-137 in the world that could have possibly made its way inside these bottles 161 years before the first atomic bomb. Subsurface soils and sediments are also dated by measuring the activity of cesium-137. Light-sensitive phototubes operate according to the photoelectric effect. Incoming photons strike a photocathode, that cylindrical screen. Non-radioactive cesium is coated on the surface of the screen. The light knocks electrons out of its surface, which are attracted to an anode, that wire in front of the cylindrical screen. The electric current produced depends on the brightness of the incoming light. One major application of the phototube was in the reading of optical soundtracks for projected films. Here I've highlighted the optical soundtrack in yellow. It's right there on the film along with the movie frames. Phototubes were used in a variety of light sensing applications until they were superseded by solid state photoresistors and photodiodes, which are far smaller and cheaper to produce. Vacuum tubes, ask your grandfather, were the active components of most electronics before the 1960s. These were the transistors of their age. Inside, the glass envelope had to have a very good vacuum to operate. Once the air is pumped out and the tube is sealed, the remaining gas was pushed to the glass wall by evaporating a low boiling point metal, absorbing and trapping the gas. This part of the tube was called a getter. You can see the ring-shaped getter at the top of the tube on the left. To heat up the getter and vaporize the metal, often cesium, the tube is placed inside an induction coil like you see here. The induction coil's large AC current causes another high current to flow in the getter ring, heating it up and vaporizing the cesium. This is NBS-1, the first atomic clock, which started operating in 1959. Cesium isotopes are used as an atomic resonance frequency standard in these clocks, just as a pendulum regulates a grandfather clock. Cesium clocks monitor the frequency of microwave radiation emitted by cesium's electrons and use this frequency as a time reference. Owing to the high accuracy of the cesium atomic clock, the international definition of one second is based on the cesium atom, Specifically, the second is defined as 9,192,631,770 vibrations of microwaves given off by a certain atomic transition of the cesium atom. NBS-1 was off by less than one second every 274 years. This is NBS-6, which is 10 times as accurate as NBS-1. It was accurate to one second in 274,000 years. It came online in 1975. NIST F1 was the first cesium fountain clock, a technology we don't have time to describe here. It was brought online about the year 2000 and will neither gain nor lose more than one second in 100 million years. And this is NIST F2, the most accurate cesium fountain clock and currently the most accurate clock in the world. NIST F2 shouldn't gain or lose more than one second every 300 million years. The United States civilian time and frequency standard is based on this clock at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. These atomic clocks play a vital role in aircraft guidance systems, global positioning satellites, the internet, cellular telephone transmissions, as well as a host of scientific applications. 
You can see in this graph that since 1950, the accuracy of our atomic clocks has gotten better and better. The current atomic clock, NIST F2, is 100,000 times as accurate as the first atomic clock, NBS1. By the way, the agency in charge of our timekeeping changed from NBS, the National Bureau of Standards, to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, in 1988, hence the change in the standards nomenclature. Again, NIST F2 is off less than one second every 300 million years. The U.S. Military Frequency Standard, the United States Naval Observatory Timescale, is based on 48 weighted atomic clocks, including 25 cesium clocks. This is the smallest atomic clock, called a chip scale atomic clock, or CSAC. The chip scale atomic clock is only one half the size of a grain of rice. Though not as accurate as its larger cousins, they are accurate enough for many civilian purposes and can be packaged and included in devices at a far more reasonable price. No one, to my knowledge, has put one in a wristwatch yet. These tiny atomic clocks would gain or lose no more than one second in over 27 years. By the way, the commercial miniature cesium atomic clock on the right costs about $1,500 compared to earlier cesium clocks at a cost of about $30,000. One cool application using cesium clocks was in the demonstration of Einstein's theories of relativity. The special theory of relativity predicts that clocks moving relative to a stationary observer will run slower than non-moving clocks. In 1971, physicist Joseph Haffel and astronomer Richard Keating took four atomic clocks on board two airplanes. They carefully synchronized them with clocks on the ground at the U.S. Naval Observatory. On the bottom right is one of the actual atomic clocks on board the flight now preserved at Hewlett-Packard. They flew the planes around the Earth, one in a westerly direction and one in an easterly direction. Remember that the clocks on the ground were in motion towards the east because of the rotation of the Earth. This meant that the plane flying east was moving faster than the ground clocks and the plane flying west was moving slower than the ground clocks. There is an additional factor due to gravity and the general theory of relativity, always causing the higher altitude clocks to run faster. When both of these relativistic effects are considered, you can see that the total predicted loss or gain in the third column matches very well with the experimentally measured loss or gain of the flying cesium atomic clocks in the fourth column. This isn't the only time cesium has left the surface of the Earth. All 31 GPS satellites have two highly accurate cesium atomic clocks on board. They also have two rubidium atomic clocks. It's the super accurate timing of signals from these satellites that gives us our accurate position using the navigation systems in our cars, boats, planes, and even our wristwatches. Ion thrusters are a possible use for cesium. The outer electron is stripped off the atom and the resulting positively charged ion is accelerated out the back of the spacecraft, providing constant thrust for long periods of time. Xenon has been the fuel of choice up to now, but its expense and the need of super cold cryogenic storage make it a complicated fuel to handle. Cesium may be easier, and development of this type of engine, seen here, is ongoing. Cesium has no biological role. You may think its highly reactive chemical nature would make for some dangerous chemicals, too. But sodium is also highly reactive, and yet in combination with chlorine, also a highly reactive gas, yields common sodium chloride, or table salt. Likewise, 
Combine cesium with chlorine and you get a different salt, cesium chloride, with about the same toxicity. No, I've never tasted this expensive variety of salt and neither should you. We'll end today's talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about cesium. Hot-headed firebrand, whose violent behavior hides a softer side. This has been Tales from the Periodic Table, an ongoing exploration of the stuff that makes up the universe. The next program in this series will examine another interesting element, barium. I hope you'll join us. This is your host, Ron Hipschman, and I want to thank you for watching Tales from the Periodic Table.